Dr. Titan is the director of the Thai Institute of Security and International Studies and associate professor of political, international political economy at Chulalongkorn University. That barely describes his attributes. Um, uh, Titanan is a graduate of two uh, illustrious uh, United States universities, as well as of LSE in London. Um, and uh, he has a very long record, uh, distinguished record, as a writer and speaker on Thai politics, political economy, and regional affairs, and a commentator for the likes of CNN, Al Jazeera, BBC, uh, and The Economist. And, uh, uh, intelligence unit. I had the good fortune to meet uh, Titanan nearly 20 years ago um, when I had just, when he had just returned to Thailand on completing his studies uh, in London and when I was director of the New Zealand Asia Institute uh, in Auckland. Um, and since then um, he has uh, maintained very close contact with New Zealand uh, in various ways, including with New Zealand representatives of course in Bangkok, but also in terms of making visits to New Zealand, including as a visiting fellow to this university. And in that regard, I'd like to particularly welcome Council Member Farid Soss uh, tonight uh, to, these, um, to these proceedings, another old friend of, of Dr. Tithanan. Uh, this, however, is a very fleeting visit that, um, uh, to Wellington, um, uh, for which we are sorry. Uh, we're glad you've managed to fit us into the schedule, um, uh, Jay, but no time to compare the Martinborough vineyards with the vineyards in, uh, in Khao Yai in northeast Thailand, where you were just a few weeks ago. Um, but tonight we've asked um, Titanan to talk about some of the upcoming challenges facing uh, Southeast Asia. This is a week when um, coronavirus, an impeachment trial, and the departure of the UK from the EU have dominated the news. And it would be easy to overlook the fact that there are some major hurdles ahead in Southeast Asia, uh, with elections in at least two ASEAN states, and one of these, yours, Thailand, taking on the chairmanship of ASEAN. And this is a time when the United States President seems to show total disinclination to visit the region, suggesting that ASEAN leaders might better visit the state. Um, just a few weeks ago on social media, um, in a reference to developments in his own country, Titanan was described as the incurable optimist. But when he gets mad, things must be bad. <laughs> So um, I think on that note, um, we should find out whether we should share some of the optimism or some of the concern about developments and prospects in the region. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James, and um, Excellencies. Uh, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, students, friends. Uh, first, I, I would like to still say belated Happy New Year. We have this Chinese New Year, but I also say a Happy New Decade. I think this is uh, not just 2020 a new year, but 2020 beginning of a new decade. And I think that by the end of this decade, I wonder where Thailand will be, where I will be. I can kind of guess uh, where I will be, but maybe um, that's a way to think uh, uh, in terms of the uh, the time the time and space and the framework uh, for what I would uh, speak about today, this evening. So first I want to apologize to those who have had uh, to listen to me already today. Um, and uh, you know, I gave uh, some talks, I thought that maybe I'll take a day uh, you know, from, from uh, engagement in, the, in Australia, not too far from uh, New Zealand, or come here, maybe I'll give one talk and then see some friends and I'll have a, some clean air to breathe and then go back to early tomorrow morning, but uh, as it happens, this is my fourth talk today, and um, it possibly I may end up with a fifth talk if I don't uh, uh, eat well this evening. Um, so, for those who heard earlier, uh, so far today I've talked about uh, the region in, in uh, different, uh, different ways, different uh, multifaceted uh, dimensions uh, about the, you know, regionally, about the Mekong region, uh, New Zealand has a lot of interest in there, and then about the South China Sea, U.S.-China rivalry, and so on. Uh, also, for lunch, a very deep uh, dive into Thai politics, Thai society, uh, democracy, and authoritarianism in Thailand. So, for this talk, um, the, the title I just learned, uh, 
at lunchtime that the title is Upcoming Challenges. So I want to talk about three challenges. Uh, first is a challenge of history uh, for Southeast Asia. Second is a challenge of geography. And then uh, third, a challenge of uh, uh, democratic governance, democracy, authoritarianism, uh, how, to, how to govern for those who are governing and those who are being governed. Uh, this, I think, is out of sync in many places in Southeast Asia. So am I okay on audio? I'm not used to staying stationary with microphones so far away, but... Uh, so, you know, I've said uh, earlier, and I'll say this in a different way, um, the, the global order is, is breaking down. I mean, it's, uh, so, you know, we are actually not seeing a linear, we're not seeing a linear projection uh, progress um, direction for, for global history. We, we're seeing a more circuitous, circular uh, kind of, uh, the past is becoming the future, and we're going back to the past. Uh, history is kind of coming back in a, in a tough way. Um, we used to think that after two major world wars, and uh, New Zealand uh, knows this very well, that maybe after the, the, those two wars, um, there would be a way to organize the international system, to come up with the right rules and institutions, um, to, to govern uh, you know, state behavior, uh, interstate relations, um, and so we've had a good long run. It uh, lasted for almost seven decades. But over the last, um, I would say last decade, you know, we've seen some signs of the erosion of the global order, the, the, the rules-based liberal international order for some time. But I think the last um, decade, especially the last several years, the, um, this has been more salient and conspicuous, um, you know, visible and, and a, little, a little bit existential. Uh, we saw uh, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even though despite um, the Cold War, despite the U.S.-Soviet uh, Union to confrontation, rivalry, which at that time to me, you know, the U.S.-China rivalry is, um, is, is not military, but it is direct, right? But the, the U.S.-Soviet Union was um, military, but it was indirect. So the U.S. and Soviet Union, they fought in, in proxy arenas. But it was a indirect, but you know, a, a non-military. I mean, for China's non-military, for, for the USSR, it was a military. Uh, so you had uh, the Reagan years fighting in Angola, Cambodia, um, Nicaragua, and you know, you know, throughout the Cold War. Um, that conflict, that rivalry was, um, you know, it was, it took pretty much occupied uh, our countries, our education, in my case, international relations, international political economy. Um, and so we thought then that despite the Cold War, Soviet Union confrontation, uh, the bipolarity, but the West, the, the rest of the world was coming up. In a way, post-Cold War, post-Second World War was a, was a kind of a clean slate, a, a new slate. You can, when you have a new slate, the advantage is you can design, you can implement, you can come up with a new system, you can start over. And that's what uh, the world kind of did, uh, led by the United States and, you know, the, the, the European uh, coal and steel community, became the, the, the commission eventually, the European Union. Uh, so Europe, uh, the main arena of the global conflicts in the 20, 20th century, um, saw something else. It saw a long peace, prosperity, <coughs> in the economic integration. It became the crowning achievement of the post-war order. Right? And around um, the world, you saw a lot of uh, trade. New Zealand is very trade dependent. World trade growth um, uh, you know, increased uh, steadily, uh, more uh, trade liberalization. Uh, financial systems uh, um, was developed, more capital markets, um, you know, money markets, and so on. And so we saw, for a better part of 50 years and longer, a system that kind of worked, rules-based system. Um, but that now has run its course. And, uh, you know, this is not um, novel, it's not a new finding. I think uh, uh, 10 years ago, when people were talking about this, it, uh, it caught some by surprise. People didn't 
quite were not quite convinced, but now I think this it's not dispute in, in dispute anymore that the rules based liberal international order uh, is unraveling. Uh, the debate is you know what to do, how to how to show it up, how to uh, maintain it uh, to the extent that we can. Um, but I think it's going to be difficult. As a result, the Soviet Union has uh, kind of collapsed, disintegrated in its place. Uh, and after its fall, after its demise, there was a long run. The post-Cold War also had a pretty long run, a three-decade run. And those three decades were precarious and uncertain. And, uh, and you know, we saw in the 2000s, the global war on terror um, will last a uh, couple of decades. China's rise, I think this is the, the big news on the international scene, the biggest news, the biggest development is that China has risen, is ascendant, and it has more or less kind of caught up with the, um, with the United States. Um, as a result, we see a return to rivalry and competition again. This time not between the Soviet Union and the US, of course, but between the US and China. And in a way, um, China is a logical successor to the Soviet Union. It has a hybrid system, it's market consistent, it's state-led, it's state-led kind of capitalism, but it's market consistent, it's not market-led, but at the same time, it's kind of like a, a totalitarian government still. It's certainly authoritarian. Um, it's totalitarian in a way that Mike Pence, the vice president, said the whole of government, that's how they, 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 they depict it, define it. Whole of government means the government's in control. It's very top-down. Uh, it's single party rule, and to that extent, you know, the Soviet Union was kind of like that. Um, but this conflict between the US and China, which I think will be uh, long term, I think uh, you know, we're just seeing the beginning of it. Uh, we're seeing a pause now, US election year, but it will resume, I, I, I believe. Um, and the nature of the conflict, you know, you think about China, and being in Thailand, I see a lot of China from tourists, from academics, uh, also visit the country, uh, cultural influences and so on. Um, so for China, they, they think, the Chinese, that you know, this is their time. Right, you know, and you can't blame them. You go to Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Chengdu, they, they are big and powerful. The Chinese tourists come to Thailand, you know, the Thai economy, 12% 12, 12 of the GDP is from tourism. One quarter of it and coming up to one third of it is from China. And, you know, you take a kind of a, a glance at the distance in tourist places. In the old days, 20, 30, 40 years ago, there would be a lot of Caucasians. Now it's all a lot of black heads and there are a lot of them are Chinese. Um, Chinese villagers would come as tourists from the middle of China somewhere, and they look very provincial, they, they speak very loudly, but when they pay, they have lots of cash to pay. Um, so they, they've caught up with the Americans. You go to Shanghai, Beijing, and I think the Americans, when they see this, they must feel resentful. Right? Strong, powerful, wealthy, you know, not all wealthy, but really coming up. I mean, the GDP per capita is higher than most middle-income countries now. And so they probably look at China and the Americans. Shanghai, Beijing is more advanced, more modern, newer than Manhattan. The lifts work better, the trains are newer, you name it. And, and the Chinese are everywhere. So for the Chinese, uh, while the Americans may be resentful, China will see it as, this is, this is their time. It's, I call this a, a kind of a manifest <coughs> resurgence. Manifest resurgence because uh, the Chinese see this is their right to regain the lost glory. A thousand years ago, they had an empire. Um, Two thousand years ago and beyond, you know, and even before that. And so, for them, the Belt and Road Initiative is is their entitled, inevitable right to regain lost ground. Only in the last couple of hundred years that they have lost ground. Um, so you see the belt extending to across Eurasia. Uh, that's pretty much corresponds with the old Silk Road. And then the, um, the Maritime Silk Road, 
corresponds with the uh, Zhang He Maritime Expedition uh, in the 17th century. Um, so it's not out of nowhere, Belt and Road Initiative. It's based on historical um, conceptualization, uh, historical kind of glory, glorious past that they've had. Um, so the US-China conflict now will I think, intensify, as I said, and you can see it's becoming, it's, it's direct, but it's non-military. So trade, tariffs, technology, Culture, culture, cultural, even tourists. Chinese tourists being told by the government, don't go to America, they have a gun, gun culture. Difficult to get visas now anyway to go to America. Fewer, fewer Chinese students will go to America because of visa restrictions. More skepticism, more suspicion in America. The US academics now doing more studies on China, Chinese influence operations in, in America. On the other hand, the Americans in China um, don't always feel safe. Right? You, can, you can be detained, you can be questioned. Um, so this kind of antagonism going both ways, uh, I think will, will, um, will intensify. And uh, we are seeing in the region a kind of a return of this rivalry competition uh, amidst, against the backdrop drop of the uh, erosion breakdown, unraveling of the global order. Um, so what we will see most likely is a, a more kind of a every man for himself, self-help, international system. And you see a breakdown, I mean, the, the Brexit is just one, one latest uh, manifestation that the established liberal international order doesn't work uh, the way it used to. And I think the UK might not be the last country to pull out of the EU. Um, I think the EU will still survive by, in 10 years' time. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. In 10 years' time, it's plausible <coughs> that we can see conflict. Um, not, in, not like the World War I or World War II. Um, we're already seeing some cyber wars. Um, we see, you know, now uh, weapon systems is cyber driven, and uh, you don't need uh, a lot of tanks and a lot of uh, artillery, and, you know, you have uh, drones that can. Uh, knock out, uh, do assassinations from miles away, satellite driven. Um, so this is kind of uh, technologies that we have uh, today. And I think uh, uh, if there's such a conflict, it will not pan out like World War I, World War II, but it can still be a kind of a global, global conflict. Uh, I look at the, the region, uh, South China Sea, uh, very tense, China is a uh, has built and uh, weaponized a, a string of artificial islands. I think uh, in my area uh, of residence, Thailand, mainland Southeast Asia, China has built a lot of dams, there's seven dams with 21 more planned um, upstream. So China is leveraging, capitalizing, if you will, exploiting um, its uh, position uh, around uh, the neighborhood. Uh, in the South China Sea, the Macron region. But uh, even the Belt and Road, uh, China has uh, lent uh, money for projects that are uh, uh, not doing well, not in demand in Sri Lanka, in Maldives, um, and beyond, and uh, engaging in this so-called debt diplomacy. A lot of countries are more indebted to China, and this goes all the way to Africa. Um, so the US is, is pushing back, pushing back because uh, it will not allow, even though the U.S. is not shouldering the burdens of the system that it created, crafted, um, it's not going to allow another country to kind of supplant it. So this uh, kind of rivalry and competition, I think, uh, uh, be very difficult to, uh, uh, to put a stop to. Um, around the region, uh, where I come from, you can see uh, this competition, I think, manifesting. Uh, fiercely, uh, and, and the South China Sea is one, to, uh, and, but also, you know, across the rim, uh, you still see this in the, with, Chi with Japan, East China Sea, South China Sea, the Mekong, Taiwan Strait, so all around China, um, you see these uh, tensions. And then now, the U.S. has pushed back with the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, so-called, but it's really a pushback against China's BRI, the FOIP. Um, and China knows it. 
And uh, FOIP, unlike the, um, you know, the Obama strategy of pivot rebalance, it doesn't have the economic arm, it's more security driven. And as a result, in New Zealand and uh, Southeast Asia, we have to be aware that um, with some alarm that uh, the Asia Pacific as a frame, as a, as a paradigm, is being overtaken by the, the Indo-Pacific. And Asia Pacific is more prosperity driven, Asia Pacific more security driven. Uh, so that's the reality. I, uh, you know, so history in a way, what we used to see, we haven't seen in my lifetime, um, but we could see kind of a, a broader uh, kind of global conflict again, even though uh, not so long ago we thought we put an end to that, that somehow we found a way uh, with the right environment, rules, institutions, understanding that you could put a stop to endless global conflict. But now we're seeing signs that this could return to the past and we could see global conflict again. Geography matters very much in this mix. You know, where I come from is the mainland, so in fact the pollution, uh, we have had the worst uh, in recent memory, uh, uh, smog or haze uh, in Thailand, but in fact it's in inner Asia. So from Mongolia to India, to China, mainland Southeast Asia, agricultural burning and you know, exacerbated, compounded by climate change conditions. Um, but geography is important because if you're an island, uh, I know it's very, very windy here, but, but at least it feels like clean air. Um, you know, so the, 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 the current uh, present uh, uh, New Zealand envoy in Bangkok uh, told me to bring back two bottles of clean air. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I will try to breathe really deep and um, breathe it out uh, when I see him. Um, well, mainland and maritime, uh, they are showing signs of diver divergence. So in Southeast Asia, there are 10 countries, there's ASEAN. Uh, you know, I call them CLMTV, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, five countries, mainland, and BIMPS, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Singapore, maritime. So CLMTV, BIMPS, we're seeing more um, divergences. Uh, so the mainland, for example, is very much, much more um, under, within China's orbit. So China has, a, you can even say, client states, you know, I, go that far, in Cambodia, in Laos. Laos is building this Chinese rail from Kunming to Vientiane, uh, more than $6 billion, and uh, that's about 55% of the Lao GDP. So Laos is going to be indebted to China, paying off uh, for the next two decades indefinitely. And that will mean that Laos will be beholden to, to China. Um, Cambodia, China is the largest investor, trade partner, aid donor, um, Thailand, to an extent, uh, also within China's orbit, having had a military government for five years, and now kind of a disguised authoritarian rule, um, leaning more towards China. Uh, Myanmar, certainly, um, you know, Xi Jinping knows how to, uh, the Chinese uh, leaders, they know how to court and when to court um, countries like Myanmar. So Myanmar has a, you know, the, the, the sore spot in Myanmar, even though they have many good stories you can see you know, on trade investment, um, uh, infrastructure development, standards of living, but, but it's not filtering through, it's not cascading to the countryside. But nevertheless, economy is expanding 6%, 7% a year. But the sticking point is the Rakhine state in the westernmost province where they have more than 700,000 Muslims, Rohingya uh, ethnicity Muslims now chased out of the country, persecuted and residing along the border with Bangladesh, inside Bangladesh. You know, like uh, over the years, Myanmar caught international attention for having a military dictatorship and a female, attractive female leader, iconic leader for democracy, Aung San Suu Kyi. So now international news focused on Myanmar, it's all about the Rohingyas, mostly how Aung San Suu Kyi has failed um, to protect um, rights and freedoms. Um, so this is a time when China moves in. So Xi Jinping just visited uh, Myanmar 
just like the, how the Chinese says, you know, open arms to the Thai military government. Hun Sen elected dictatorship. Laos, Communist Party rule. Vietnam is the exception. Vietnam has a lot of uh, contentious issues with China. I would say in Southeast Asia, um, Vietnam and Philippines, in some areas now, they're in the same category, almost a separate category now because of China. Um, so you have mainland, you have maritime, you have South China Sea, Mekong region. Um, geography matters because China is the residential superpower. It's nearby. It's next door to Laos, next door to Myanmar. Without China's help, Myanmar cannot uh, deal with the ethnic insurgencies in the north. Um, the ethnic wars, I mean, actually, uh, uh, not just insurgencies, but uh, uh, ethnic conflicts, uh, violent. <coughs> and to maritime, China is dominant, uh, uh, except for three countries that China has some, a lot of contentious issues with the Philippines and Vietnam I mentioned, but also Singapore. There's been a couple of uh, recent surveys suggesting that uh, of all 10 Southeast Asian countries, uh, those with uh, the least favorable and even more critical views of China, Vietnam, Philippines, Philippines and then Vietnam and Singapore. Thailand, Indonesia, uh, in between, on the pro-China side, about just over 50%. But the ones that are very much uh, in China's camp would be uh, Brunei, Laos and Cambodia. Uh, Vietnam, a, a little bit uh, between Indonesia, Thailand, and, and the, the other three. Um, so, you know, the um, divergences that we're seeing with China's dominant, more mainland, more contentious, contentious issues with the, the maritime Southeast Asian countries. Um, the United States, they, they're trying to up their game, but uh, being far away, you know, and also being preoccupied at home, uh, they have a lot of constraints. And not another constraint, the U.S. doesn't have the... Um, financial heft that it used to, doesn't have the money anymore to finance these uh, programs, FOIP. They have the, uh, what they call the BUILD Act, but uh, you know, 50, 60 billion dollars. Uh, they have the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act. This is an act of uh, uh, Congress uh, to um, uh, do more capacity building in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, five billion over uh, five years. Um, so not, not a lot of uh, uh, resources to put behind the FOIP, to push back against China. Australia, I see, upping its game a lot. So I, actually, in Southeast Asia, we're trying to work more with uh, middle powers like uh, Australia. Japan is a very important country. In these surveys, interestingly, uh, Japan comes in, to, uh, uh, in some of the questions, number three, as the most important country in the region after China and the United States. But 10 years forward, China way up, U.S. some down, Japan some up. For the, uh, the survey covers the South Pacific, uh, you'll be pleased to know in New Zealand is the third most important after China and Australia. Um, you know, so this is kind of like the, the views of the um, policy elites and the strategic uh, analysts. So the geography uh, is consequential. Uh, China is, uh, this is its backyard. So Southeast Asia is going to come under China's orbit and shadow more and more. Uh, unless they can find countervailing sources of uh, rivalry, uh, US, Japan to some extent, but Japan and China now have an ongoing realignment, uh, which uh, we, we are a bit concerned about. Um, and then South Korea to some extent, Australia to some extent, but the US are now, I think, uh, the US has not fared uh, favorably in these uh, surveys uh, is recognized as a superpower, hard power, very strong, but the commitment uh, is not there as much, especially under Trump, uh, and the resources are not there under any president. But even beyond Trump, uh, people in the region, in Southeast Asia, are doubting uh, U.S. commitment and resolve, even though they're trying to push back hard against China. Uh, it doesn't seem like they have a co cohesive, coherent, longer-term strategy, and certainly not the resources. So the, the geography of the region, it, it doesn't mean that Southeast Asia is going to split up. Uh, it's facing, again, the kind of uh, challenge of history that it did in the past, which is that uh, the major powers are threatening uh, to divide the region again. The region, Southeast Asia, during the Cold War, was divided between the communist camp, Indochina, and then the... the, the, the the Association of Southeast Asian uh, Nations, ASEAN, uh, 
Um, you know, and then they eventually, after the Cold War, they reunified, or they unified into all 10 countries. But now China is dividing up uh, ASEAN again, to Cambodia, Laos, and uh, Brunei, certainly uh, in their pocket, in their camp. Uh, the rest are trying to find ways to hedge or balance against uh, China's belligerence, I would say, even not just assertiveness, but belligerence. Um, the U.S. can play that role to some extent, but some are doubtful uh, of the U.S. Uh, commitment and resolve and, uh, and resources. Uh, so we're looking for ways to hedge and balance. Um, so New Zealand is very much in this mix, whereby um, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, about the role of education. I think uh, New Zealand can really uh, play a win-win role. Uh, language, the English language. The U.S. doesn't have very good uh, trust generally now across the region, uh, except in Singapore and Vietnam and Philippines. Um, the role, you know, climate change, for example, capacity building, a lot of programs that New Zealand has had, uh, trade, agriculture, uh, technology, know-how. Um, but uh, Southeast Asia is looking for partners uh, to kind of uh, find ways to navigate and, and handle the, 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 the China challenge. Uh, and this leads me to uh, 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 the battleground, a major battleground of this will be between democracy and authoritarianism. authoritarianism. Democracy and autocracy, democracy and dictatorship to different degrees. So uh, Cambodia have dictatorship. Thailand, you kind of now have a kind of a I would even say a, a darkening autocracy. Um, Myanmar, there's a civil military compromise, but it's kind of an authoritarian place to do with, you know, more infringements, violations of uh, basic uh, rights and freedoms, arresting journalists and so on. Vietnam, Laos, of course, authoritarian. So you, across the region, uh, 20 years ago, it looked the other way. It looked like the region was democratizing. Thailand, after 1997 constitution, looked like it was the, well, it was written about in academic literature as the prime example, the, the forefront example of demo democratic transition. Thailand in the late 1990s, early 2000s, a stretch of about, hmm, not, not quite a decade, but close to. Um, Indonesia made a dramatic, extraordinary turnaround. Uh, in the late 1990s, you know, from authoritarianism to a very precarious democratic transition, violent one, um, and, you know, crossing into the 21st century uh, with some compromise, um, you know, some domestic peace, and eventually a democratic transition that has led to a consolidation. So, you know, Indonesia, despite all of its challenges, is a democratically consolidated place, space, and I think there will be no coup in Indonesia. Uh, the only country I think that could be a coup, a military coup again, is Thailand, which is sad to say. Uh, I don't see a coup even in the Philippines, which has been coup prone in the past, and not in Myanmar, which has been coup prone in the past. Myanmar could, but you know, as long as this civil military compromise power sharing um, holds up, Oh, you know, cool. And then uh, Vietnam, of course, uh, not Singapore. It's the only country, I mean, that has moved, that has not moved beyond uh, military coups and military rule is really kind of Thailand. So Thailand's gone in reverse direction, authoritarianism, autocracy. But you can see this resurgence of authoritarian rule across, rule and values across the region. Uh, Thailand, but there also have been viol you know, viol violations of human rights, basic freedoms in Philippines, um, certainly Myanmar, uh, Cambodia, blatant, um, Laos, blatant, uh, to some extent, uh, Vietnam, you know, suppression of dis dissidents, uh, even Indonesia, a little bit of creeping Islamism, erosion of uh, uh, open values, you know. Um, and Malaysia certainly in the same, same boat. Um, so it's a discouraging trend, but I think it's not terminal. So it doesn't mean that authoritarianism will, be, will win the day. And this is another thing that uh, I leave behind for New Zealand um, as my own kind of uh, recommendation is not to abandon. Well, you will not abandon, but not to de-emphasize, de-prioritize. 
um, democratic values, promotion and support. Because uh, there are a lot of uh, people in these countries who are fighting for a better day, who are, uh, you know, trying to uphold and fight for a democratic system. And I don't say democracy, democratic system as a, as a you know, some great hope and uh, panacea for, for these countries. But I've seen firsthand that it's the only kind of system that allows its grievances and expectations to be addressed in, in, in a satisfactory, sufficient manner where you have, if these countries can be authoritarian, like China, which means that you can really have the cake and eat it too. You can be authoritarian, top down, you can have a, a dynamic economy, and then um, uh, people will then kind of uh, buy into it or put up with it or accommodate or support. But in these other countries in Southeast Asia, authoritarianism, except Vietnam, has not worked, has not delivered. Uh, Thailand's growth lags behind uh, regional peers. Uh, Myanmar, low base, they're growing. Um, Cambodia, low base, growing. But people in Cambodia and Myanmar are not happy. You know, widening inequality, environmental de degradation, you know, all kinds of problems. Um, so you know, I'm just thinking that uh, as, you know, if you talk about the US-China rivalry competition, I think the, the battleground is still uh, about the ideas of how to organize a socio-economic political system. Uh, China has done it its way and has become an example, the so-called China model, to a lot of countries where you can have authoritarian, top-down, centralized rule with a growing economy, uh, social controls and so on, and that people still can, can buy into. But uh, this is not um, readily available in the other countries in Southeast Asia. So between shades of democracy and shades of dictatorship, this is the, the Southeast Asia neighborhood, uh, and it's a moving uh, mix. I can see 20 years from now, it doesn't mean that authoritarianism is won the day. It will depend a lot on how China does. If China keeps doing what it's been doing, which is, it can have lower growth, even 5%. But if it can, if people, if Chinese people, 1.4 billion people can still buy into it and they can still deliver. You know, they don't have Facebook, they don't have Google, they have Baidu and Weibo and, and so on. And, and uh, their technology is good too. You know, the 5G technology is very good. We don't trust it, you don't trust it here. But I can tell you, a lot of people are going to use it. Thailand certainly will use 5G Huawei. Huawei is big in Thailand. So it depends how the Chinese do, if they can keep this up, you know, then that, that battleground in Southeast Asia might shift, might gravitate towards China, um, more shades of authoritarianism, democracy discredited because it's not delivered. You know, when you have, a, when you have democracy, democratic transition in these countries, Southeast Asia or anywhere else, and the expectations of people are higher. Right, that, well, democracy, what is it going to bring? Okay, get to vote, great, uh, freedom. But it has to bring other things. Um, more equality, more development, you know, infrastructure and so on. Myanmar not getting that. Outside Yangon, Mandalay. Thailand, worsening disparity. So elections has led to like protest demonstrations. People have a bad memory of the last two decades of elections. And some places in this region, they equate elections with democracy with corruption. Right. Now, in Singapore, corruption is very low. I would say Singapore democracy actually is working okay. They have opposition. Government is very responsive. Young faces in cabinet, a lot of talent. They try to stay ahead of the curve. They try to address people's expectations and grievances. Um, in the other countries, Democracy has not performed as well as it should have. On the other hand, authoritarianism also has not worked. Thailand is seeing low growth this year, incompetent government, cannot address pollution, cannot address drought, the virus. You know, I come here, I was very impressed. Uh, you have a crisis response team, it's very coherent, you know, uh, going in the same direction, understanding some uh, command structure, 
right down to looking after your own people. Thai government? Nothing. I mean, they talk about, eventually now, finally, we'll bring some Thais home from Wuhan. But for early days, the flights from China still continue. Only some flights have been suspended. And, you know, the flight from Wuhan was suspended right away. But a lot of people from China, they go from Wuhan to other places and they, come, they can come over. Why? Because they care about tourism. Why? Because they, 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 they feel beholden, a little beholden to China. Don't want to upset China. Um, so um, I think that between this uh, democracy, authoritarianism, um, that's where the Southeast Asia battleground is being fought. And, uh, you know, so I'm a proponent of a more kind of open system. And I think the younger generations that are coming up, I can tell you, um, they want a different kind of, Thai of Thailand. Uh, but across the region, I also can speak for Cambodia. A lot of people voted younger. The younger, the more they voted for the opposition, CNRP, Cambodian National Rescue Party. Uh, Myanmar. So I think that one way forward, one good outcome for the future is young people under 40. Uh, because it's their future. They care more about climate change than the older people. Plastic in Thailand, a lot of young people care about plastic, elimination of plastic. So um, that's how I would like to leave this, you know, the challenges of uh, Southeast Asia, um, the return of history uh, with some risks and uh, in an alarming fashion, and uh, how I think uh, it's uh, been uh, reshaped by um, the geography of the region. Uh, you know, for the longest time since uh, the, the outset, uh, this, this is a, you know, unnatural region. Uh, it has a mainland part, it has a shared history, the maritime part, more shared history, and I think we're seeing that geography making a difference. It doesn't mean that ASEAN as an organization will, will unravel, I think it will be around, but it might uh, have uh, different interests and divergences among the different members, the mainland and maritime. And then uh, finally, I think the, the battleground, US-China rivalry, uh, the main, one major battleground would be this uh, uh, democracy and dictatorship uh, in Southeast Asia. And I think, uh, you know, I hope, and I'm working for uh, democracy to, to, to have uh, better days ahead. Uh, it will spend on, it will depend on China, it will also depend on, on the Western countries, especially the US. If they don't work well, if they don't show a good example, it will not be a good example for, for Southeast Asia. Thank you very much.